Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming to, uh, to listen to us. Um, CJ's put together this fabulous uh, uh, PowerPoint um, uh, presentation. And so actually, uh, to get us going, I'm going to pass it over. Hi, how are you? Um, I actually did a version of this presentation for a few students last month, so I apologize if there are any students who came to that one and are hearing a repeat of this one. Um, but I'm very excited to share some of the uh, sort of behind the scenes uh, secrets and no spoilers as much as we can uh, throughout this presentation. But maybe we'll start with the trailer to get you excited for the rest of it. Here we go. I'm gonna let Alyssa lead uh, because she was definitely part of the first portion of our production process, but this slide, for those who can read it, is just sort of a breakdown of uh, how we put this epic show together. Um, just so you know, it's a first time collaboration between Sh the Stratford Festival and Robert Lepage's company, Ex Machina, um, and to my knowledge, started with a two week workshop last November. Uh, yeah, so we did two workshops um, with Robert Lepage and his company Ex Machina in Quebec City. And uh, they have a wonderful space which is um, what we refer to in theatre as a black box. It's an open space um, that uh, can turn into anything. Um, and in the first version of, of the workshop, we had, I think, nine actors there, uh, something like that. Um, so some of them were playing multiple roles in the same scene, some of them uh, women were playing men, men were playing women, um, and it was uh, uh, the point of that workshop and in many, part, in many ways the second one um, was to begin to explore the relationship of the performer into the space. Robert had already come up with um, a concept of what he wanted uh, the show to be, which is a little bit of that cinematic style that you see. He'd explored um, a different relationships of, uh, of, you know how um, uh, when you were, well, most of us, when we were growing up and our televisions were yay big and they were square, and now your television is about yay big and it's like this shape. And so uh, part of that is about, you know, it's about the advancement of technology. It's about moving from analog to digital. Um, uh, now we live in a world of all HDMI um, and it's, you know, constantly changing. And uh, through this, uh, through Coriolanus in this particular production, we see Robert presenting the show with a different lens at different places. And he uses um, in a, different resolutions and size of the stage um, to show that to you. So what we have is, is a frame, and then we have a series of screens. There are, screens that, there are two screens on each side that come in and out. There are screens on the top and bottom that come in and out. And what they do is they allow Robert to, um, to really uh, focus your eye on what he wants you to see. Um, and, uh, and he does this in a brilliant way. And, and what could have been a show about screens moving is not that at all. It's, it's as a director, he's really telling you this. He's te every time the screen moves, he's actually telling a different story to the end of that scene, to the beginning of it, to, um, to move the story forward, which is really interesting. So in that first workshop, we, ex we he ran with manual versions of those screens. So he would do, we would do, he would run a scene with the performers, do a read through, talk to them a little bit, and then he'd be like, okay, now move to this shape. And then we do, then he'd do the next scene, and he would keep going through that. We went away for a while, and, we, and at that point, um, he went through the, I think the entire show, or most of it, 
um, and then went away for a period of time, because one of the things Robert likes to do is actually um, uh, sort of sit back between, um, between rehearsal periods um, and allow, allow what was learned and the process to, uh, to sit with him and to sit with the performers, I think, as well. And we came back and we did a second workshop. And by the time we did the second workshop, uh, Stratford was more involved at that point. We brought winches to provide automated versions of the screens moving. In these workshops, we had, uh, we had sound, so we had audio going at, ver uh, at various times, so the sound designer was playing with backgrounds. We had uh, lighting, and so we would do a scene, and then uh, Robert would be like, I want to see a light that comes like this, and all of a sudden we were running to the Home Depot, and we were grabbing um, an emergency light that that would, that would give him the effect that he wanted. And in one case, actually, I think we're using the same light that we used in the second workshop um, for the tent scene, that the light that's at the back. If it's not the same one, it's actually the same one. Um, and it was just because it, it was an exploration. He liked it. Let's move forward. And so a lot of it is, a lot of the workshop process is Robert exploring with visuals, um, tweaking a bit, and and it's a fair bit of, a bit of um, uh, like uh, gaff tape and safety pins as it's like, well, let's try this. Okay, well, tape that there, do this here. Yep, that will hang there for 10 minutes. That's all we need. Great, move on. Um, and you learn through that process and also moving pretty quickly. When we came to the Stratford Festival, we started rehearsing immediately on stage, which is not usually our practice. We usually start in the rehearsal hall for a period, do some work there, then slowly introduce technology. And the way Robert works um, is that technology is, uh, you know, in many ways, it's its own character within the play. But it certainly advances, he uses technology to advance the characters, to advance the story. So as he's creating those scenes and those moments, it all has to be integrated together from the beginning. And so that's what we did. We were on stage for uh, three weeks? Something like Something that. like <laughs> three weeks. And we would do a period of rehearsal and then the evening we would all go to technical notes and sort of get to the point to advance us again to get to the next day. Um, so it was three weeks of sort of those days that begin at 8 a.m. They end at 11 p.m. You go home, you grab a couple of winks, you do it all over again. So. Um, and that was sort of our process. We got a show up, then, then we moved to Dartmouth College, apparently. Oh, no, we did a final no. tech period. Oh, we did a final <laughs> tech, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's sort of interesting. So at the end of that rehearsal period, we, um, we did an invited dress. So we, we invited um, some people to see the show to begin to see some audience reaction, because um, that's important. We also respond um, in the process to, to how the audience is responding to it. And that first run, I think we stopped five times. And I think three of those times we stopped, and these are in scene changes mainly, I think three of those times we stopped for five minutes or more. Um, and so those are the scene changes, which if you've seen them now, move slickly in about five seconds. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we sort of eventually got it there. But so what happened, we ended that, we did the invited dress. Robert went away to do, uh, to do a show with the National Ballet in Canada for a period. And we knew we were coming back in nine weeks. We were gonna do one run and then we were previewing and we were in front of sold out audiences. But we had a show that we kept stopping for five minute periods. So we got together, I got together with uh, the entire crew. I got together with the stage management team. We all sat in a room in a big round table and we started at the beginning of the show. We discussed every single aspect of the show. We discussed the set, we discussed props, we discussed um, wardrobe and where changes were. We discussed everything and how we might get to a point where we could take these five minute scene changes down to five seconds. We spent the next week, in the next nine weeks, making a series of changes to the sets, to props, to how we worked um, uh, and then Robert came back, we did a run, he was stunned, and uh, then we were in front of an audience. Now, then, they said, let's come to Dartmouth College. And I think we all went, gulp, this show's huge, it's not the sort of show that you pick up and take on the road, um, but apparently it is, because we have. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, I myself have been working on, on just the transfer, probably nonstop for about two and a half months. That's literally all I've been doing is working on the transfer. What it takes, how to prepare, what rentals we need to be here, how we're going to crew it, the relationship um, with Keely and her crew um, in the Moore Theatre. Um, uh, Keely, who's a senior production manager here, has become my new best friend. We speak multiple times a day, and we have for the past two months. Um, and uh, and and we got here. Next. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to quickly show you some visuals of, uh, Alyssa's already touched on a lot of it, but this was sort of the creative concepts that uh, Robert's team presented and what we worked on together. I won't go through this chart, but this yeah, is, okay. yeah. <laughs> Next. Uh, so this is what Alyssa was talking about, a, you know, using the screens to create different apertures, um, sort of based on cinematic, like widescreen and going to something that's more Panavision, et cetera. There's a real connection, of course, between Coriolanus in, in, in the time that it's set, which is not the modern version which we are presenting. Um, our version is, is today, mm -hmm. I, would, I would hazard a guess at. But a lot of what Robert is talking about as well is the connection between um, communication and spreading of, Cori and the story of Coriolanus is, is is uh, about a, a man and his relationship to the people and how he falls because of that relationship to the people. How the word is spread by the two tribunes about what this man is doing and how horrible it is and how Coriolanus is brought down partially by his own personality flaws, let's get real, but also partially um, through the work of the two tribunes as they're going about town, gadflying in people's ears. It's sort of the same as social media, as the dangers of, of posting something on Facebook. It's the same sort of, and those are some of the, some of the connections that Robert was trying to make between um, how the word in the, the story of Coriolanus is spread and how very much like today that is as well. Yeah, and I'll show an example of what Alyssa was just speaking of. Let me just quickly get there. So this, for instance, go back for a second. This is actually a, sort of a, a we have, this is a scene by scene of, of will this move? Yeah, It'll move, it. great. <laughs> um, so this was created by the set designer and it's a visual scene by scene before we've done anything of how the show's gonna work. So you have, this is a top view and you can see she's laid out, well, here's where the audience is, here's the sight lines, she's drawn in where the screens are, she's shown, yeah, we can still see up to there, yes, we can still see these people. So she's got a, a visual, uh, uh, you've got one, two, three different scenes here, so you have a visual of the details of the walls, of the architecture, of here you have the sauna, here you have the office space, um, uh, and then here actually we have photos from when we did the workshop. Um, and then notes, notes on uh, props, notes on uh, the scenery, and notes just on, on the environment of where they are. For instance, here it says steam room. I guarantee you that in Shakespeare's Coriolanus, it was not set in a steam room, but in ours it is. <laughs> and this is what we came up with. So this is uh, the office, um, and I kid you not, within five seconds, as Alyssa said, it then transforms into this and it's quite spectacular the way it happens. Um, and then touching base again on uh, the social media aspect, this photo, let me see if I can get this pointer thing working. So I don't know if you can see, but this guy right here has a little phone and this is sort of, you know, a little tiny detail that unless you're looking for it, you wouldn't realize, but he's definitely, you know, posting it on Facebook Live or making an Insta story because to them, like, this is Volumnia's mom. Coriolanus's mom confronting, yeah, confronting the tribunes about, about the fact that they've managed to, arrange, managed to arrange society to turn against her son and have him banished. And so she's going after them in public and it's being and recorded. Absolutely. Um, and another idea that Robert touched on was um, these tablets and it's actually based on Roman times uh, because they used to use these tablets here um, and the way that they would work is the first person would write it on one side of the tablet and then seal it and give it to their servant to then take to the next person who would write on the opposite side of the tablet and so that was sort of Roman ancient Roman texting so to speak which uh, 
we've converted into a scene here, which I will not say any more on because it's actually a very fun scene. So I'm going to move past that. No giving away, you <laughs> said it. Um, so before we go, I think into some behind the scenes stories, I'm going to show two back to back uh, videos. I, don't, I hope no one's seen them, but they are quite fun. Here we go. The whole process is, is uh, uh, simpler than people think. Of course, there, there is kind of state-of-the-art technology involved, but uh, there's good old stage craftsmanship uh, with a lot of people moving sets around and moving panels around. We workshopped the show twice, and in that time, there were different elements of the set introduced. There were changes made through that process, and then by the end of the last workshop, we had an idea of what Robert wanted at different moments in different scenes, and then we built it. Working with those pieces from the beginning, they, it almost became just second nature. It was just a part of the world. This is an extremely busy show for us. The scenes are quick, the scene changes are quicker. There's a lot of tricks to this set. There's a lot of changing one space into another, and we backstage have six stage hands who, uh, at least through Act One, are running nonstop. It's basically like a dance backstage. Set pieces are moving, actors are moving, things are happening on stage, things are happening behind the stage to make things happen for the next scene. Suddenly, the, the set is not just there as a decoration. The set is there, it actually takes part in the action. and it's, it's actually a character. It's always been a part of the choreography of the play. I don't feel like I'm fighting with any of the set pieces that are flying in and out. We worked with Robert's production team, Ex Machina, to figure out how we were going to make this set work. Of course, we have the additional challenges that we work in repertory. So not only were we building a set, we were building a set that had to come and go every day. It's a crazy world, so yeah, there's one show you're seeing out in the audience, but backstage is a whole other <laughs> mix of crazy chaos that is is happening to make the show happen. The Shakespeare forces uh, directors, even nowadays, to find ways to, to, to uh, bring the audience from one uh, time and space reality to another one. And, and, and that's, uh, that's very challenging. And of course, these challenges uh, give way to very inventive solutions. helps us kind of create uh, cinematic effects and puts us in modern context, but it is often very connected or refers to, to ancient Rome. To get away from technology a little bit, what I think is so amazing and advanced about these projections are the work of the creatives behind them. By manipulating the images, by giving ceilings, by foreshortening stuff, and just by being incredibly detailed in creating what looked like 3D spaces. There's all these this, uh, infrared technologies that exist that detects where the actor is, and it says to the computer, this is a real person, so when he moves into this imagery that we're projecting, he's an intruder to the imagery, so do not send projection on that specific intruder. So it's, very, it's a very, very naive way of explaining it, but it's, it's infrared technology pretty much. With projection, you're constantly trying to make sure the lighting doesn't wash out those images, but lighting also needs to be lighting up the people. So yeah, they're, they're intricately linked and must work together. We're asking actors to perform in a video sandwich <laughs> because there's back projected imagery behind them and there's front projection and there's all this kind of framing that goes on. So of course it asks the actors to be performing in one plane. Even amidst with all the stuff that we're doing it, with it in this particular version, for me my focus is as a play, the character and then let everything else inform. We're projecting on the car, and there's 3D mapping on the car and making it look like it's um, flying through forests in town. And, uh, and in the first part of it, though, there's rain. It's raining in the background, and then there's a different projection raining on the car. And I've now had multiple people come to me and go, how do you clean the water up off the stage when that scene is done? So apparently we're doing a pretty good job with our video. All the tech and all the, the trains, the projection, 
action. It's, it's really about the story. We're honing in on the people and everything around them is to help focus you in onto in, into the world of this Shakespearean play. And the use of new tools that are available to try to, and not just new tools, new vocabularies, new ways of integrating other forms of art into our own form of art uh, can help to keep the, uh, the craft alive. I think now would be an opportune time, though, to say, even though we're concentrating on Coriolanus and technology, one of the most important things when you're doing live theater and you're bringing the level of technology that, that we are to it is that you don't get in the way of the performances. And I think that is the spectacular thing that we have in this production, is that the technology is supporting the actors on stage, that we're working together. And I think when you come and see the show, if you haven't seen it already, um, uh, what you will find is at the end, um, while there are some spectacular things to see, you really are applauding some brilliant performances that were on that stage. And we're there to support it. We don't get in the way of it. And that's, that's a difficult line to walk. Um, I like to think we did. <laughs> Hope we did. I agree. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share a couple of stories and still not give away any spoilers, but uh, let's start with the car scene because it's one of my favorites. I think you'll be astounded when you see it um, in the Moore Theater. Uh, so this is a video image that was provided by our video designer. Um, and maybe Alyssa wants to provide a bit more information on how that works. Sure, so what you'll see on stage is a life-size car. And it's, uh, it's um, based on a, an actual 3D model of a Lancia, I believe. It's an uh, Italian sports car. And oh, there's an otter at the back. Yeah, it's a Lancia. Um, and and, uh, and so what we managed to find was a 3D model of it online, um, and we basically 3D printed the car. Um, <laughs> we did it, and we did it on our CNC machine in um, in our scene shop. We sort of what we did is we cut it into two-inch layers, sort of cut through in various parts, and then uh, and then. Um, and then had a, a CNC machine basically is an upside down router which takes away all the stuff that you don't want to be don't want to be there um, and so and we and so that's what we did and then we uh, you would do a layer and then you do the next layer and then you would laminate it together and so that's on the building side this is a car functionally the trunk opens uh, our Andre Sills, who is our Coriolanus, gets inside the car. Um, the, uh, when it rains, he turns on the windshield wipers, of course. Uh, when he's thirsty, he gets his coffee out of a 3D printed um, coffee cup holder. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, we, and the reason we did it so precisely to that model is so that we could then give that same digital model to our projection designer. And what he could do is he could build the landscape that the car is driving through. And so you have the background, but also then you have the reflection on the side of the car, on the top of the, the, top of the car, on the hood of the car, um, on the hubcaps. And each part is sort of built as a different projection. It's, and it's 3D modeled on top of it. So it's not like the projector is sort of brushing past it and parts of it you don't see. It's all, the top is what you would see with a reflection down. Um, and, and by giving that information early, we were able, he was able to, before uh, we were even rehearsing with the car, he was able to do all the work, bring it in, put it on, and off we go. We have a system, our video system, which is a very advanced video system, is able to um, uh, read where a piece of scenery is by, um, by understanding IR emitters. We put, so we have a series of IR emitters which are on the car, uh, like they're little balls and they read into our video server system. Our video server goes, oh, that's where you are. And, uh, and so we could actually, 
I could have a couple of, of our crew members take that car and push it across the stage and the video would follow it because the system goes, oh, the car is moving. So it knows exactly where it, are, where it is at any given time. So if we're slightly off spike when we set the car, it's okay because uh, the video system actually knows where it is through reading these little balls. Those little balls are actually on the door of the car because, of course, when Coriolanus gets into the car, he opens the door, and as he does, the video follows it. Now, for the average person just watching it, you're, what you're seeing is sort of what you expect to see is nothing out of the ordinary. The fact that we have a system that can actually physically do that is pretty out of the ordinary. <laughs> So it's almost like if we didn't have it, you'd be like, that looks weird. And because it doesn't look weird, it's just normal. <laughs> and that's a good segue actually to our next um, image. So this is from another one from our video designer. Um, and it's just sort of showing you the multiple layers that it takes to create one of the scenic backgrounds. Um, this is specifically for a scene in act two. Um, but what happens is, as Alyssa said, it's there's, um, sensors in the set, so as the shutters are opening to reveal the scene, you're actually watching the video move with it. And in actual fact, that's not entirely true. Oh. The moving, <laughs> the, mo the video does move with the screen, so as the screens come on and off, up and down, um, that's not done through IR emitters. All of our screens are on winches, on motors, and what we have on each of, of those winches is um, an, an encoder which reads where, uh, where the motor is in time and space. The, it then sends a message to our servers that the, to our video servers, and they sort of come together, and and, and so the, the servers have been told by the encoder, which is on our winches, oh, the wall is there, and the video goes, well, then I'll just project there. And then as the wall moves, and the encoder is sending a message going, we're moving this way, the video goes, I'm going to move with you. So it's two different types of technology, actually, that we're using to have video um, uh, chase our scenery. Awesome. Uh, this is. <laughs> I did new every actually. Day, don't you? <laughs> I was the assistant lighting designer. So, <laughs> um, but just to show you what this actually looks like um, when it's overlaid on top of each other, uh, and this is actually what it looks like in real view. So it really gives a sense of dimension and space. Like it looks like you could walk for miles behind um, behind our actors. I'm shaking my own head at it. I'm like, God, that's good. It looks really good. That's our video designer. He just yeah. does. He did a brilliant job. Absolutely. Pedro Pires. Um, this locker room scene. This was sort of something I shared with the students because um, uh, I wanted to tie a little bit into some of the challenging things that uh, had happened with our lighting design and how we, you know, worked through um, different. Uh, challenges to, to create solutions and um, I won't go too far into it but uh, the idea was initially with our scenes we had these fluorescent lights that worked in the offices that had covers um, and then for the locker room scene they were actually supposed to be turned perpendicular but because of timing we actually had to keep them parallel and it was creating a lot of glare in the audience's eyes so we had to come up with a really really creative solution as to how to light uh, the two actors but without um, making it very hard for the audience to actually watch what was happening in the scene. So again, you know, creating a space but not uh, impeding on, on it with our technology. So I'm going to skip past that part and actually get to one of the cool moments, which is going from a bar scene to a tent scene to a bar scene again. And I'm definitely going to let Alyssa run with this story. <laughs> is it always me? Um, uh, I think the interesting, what Robert said to us is, is like, I got a bar, and then I want to I, I I transfer in front of the audience's eyes to the tent scene in the, is it, the, is it one of the Volsian camps? Is it, where, it go, yeah, bar, Volsian camp, bar. Yeah, yeah. bar, Volsian camp, and then it goes back to the bar. And he's like, I want to see this happen in, in front of the audience's eyes. So the bar will lift, and the tent will be lifted by it. And we're like, that's great except the bar just came from the sky, so how is that gonna happen? <laughs> like, I, like, and so then uh, basically what we had is we had like five different departments all sitting around looking, looking at the bar and imagining the tent and then having a discussion about the different ways that um, this problem can be solved, solved. And I think it's a, to me this is a really interesting lesson in how to solve the large problems of a show and frankly of life. Um, 
uh, very philosophical there, um, uh, is that you're never going to solve it if you look at it only as a big picture. What you need to do is you need to break it down into the little elements. And so that's how we started. We went, okay, Robert wants it to lift. Well, how are we going to get the lines there? And so we went through different, can someone lift? Can someone, can they drop? Okay, well, what if they can drop? What if then, the, and so, and then, all right, so the lines will drop. Well, where will they drop from? They'll be hooked underneath. Well, what, but if they're hooked underneath, then we'll see this and da 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 Okay, well, what if actually the lines, the majority of the line is inside the bar and, and, and then somehow drops? And then so we went through the process of what is the somehow drop? Um, anyways, I'm not going to give it all away, although I think you may be about to give some of it away. Um, we, we, we solved the problem, and it was five different departments coming together in English and French. There was a moment where I saw the French team going this way, the English team going this way, that, 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 discuss, 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 and they came together, they'd come to the same solution in two different languages. Um, but but uh, to me, that's a fine example of how to solve the big problems, is to take it a little piece at a time, to work together with, um, with different brains, with uh, different approaches, and um, with a lot of patience. May I share? Go. Okay. <laughs> this is the one back uh, scene photo that I'll show you. So obviously it looks very beautiful from the front, but what's happening behind the scenes is this gloriousness. And that's how we're getting our tent up. I won't say any more about it, but uh, one of the crew guys is here and maybe might tell you about it another time. <laughs> you got to see it first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's quite cool. Um, but this is what the tent scene looks after um, the bar scene. Uh, and then again, it then transitions back to uh, the bar. So it's, it's really phenomenal. Um, the last sh story I had was um, in the first act, again, coming off of the bar uh, and then going into... Uh, an airport scene followed by an elevator scene and how quickly you can um, shift from very different locations in a small amount of time. And I'm going to pass it again to Alyssa to <laughs> describe how we went from uh, basically going from the bar to the airport and uh, how that set piece was. No, just how, how we did the, no? Was well, for, I mean, from the, uh, yeah, we go from the bar to, to the airport, and from the very beginning, um, uh, again, Robert didn't want to close the screens and, and have something happen and then, uh, and then reveal it again. He wanted everything, and, and that's his specialty in many ways, is that you're sort of seeing it happen, but you almost, it's happened before you actually realize that you've seen it happen. Um, and in this particular instance, what, you know, sort of everyone's at the bar, and then, and then as the scene moves to the airport, the bar flies out, and what we've done in the meanwhile is we've um, managed to, what we refer to as ninja, a series of fans that are behind the screen and they start to blow and you get all the air from an airfield and planes and and I I don't know I imagine helicopters but that's pretty strange um, and so but immediately with the sound and the wind blowing and the change in projection the bar has gone away and in about a second and a half you move from one space to an entirely different space. Then, of course, we bring on a series of airplane stairs, which are actually, you know that, you know when you get off like a smaller plane and the stairs come out and then they go, and they sort of, you know, the bottom swings out and then it goes out and it, la anyways, we built one of those. Because <laughs> Robert said, this is what I want. And uh, initially many of his team were going, oh, oh, it's, it's going to be expensive. It was. Um, <laughs> And, and I foolishly went, but we can do it. Uh, and I think within about 10 minutes, I'd, I was uh, texting with the coordinator of our scene shop. And he, of course, got really excited because who doesn't love a new project? Um, and before I know, knew it, he'd, like, he'd uh, had done a 3D CAD drawing of how it could work. And I was showing it to Robert. And he's like, yeah, that's it. See, it's simple. It was not simple. <laughs> Um, and it, it was really not simple, um, <laughs> but uh, but you'll yeah for the two minutes that's on stage it's 
pretty brilliant. Um, and our uh, and our scene shop uh, coordinator actually uh, he actually spoke to people from Boeing who because they had patented stairs like this, and he was trying to get the original drawings of it so that he could then figure it sort of back back engineer from there. Um, uh, but it was pretty brilliant how they how they ended up doing it. But I won't give away anything more than that. Yes. You don't need to show up now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, yeah, and then what I find, I won't give anything further as, as well, but what's interesting is then it goes from an airport scene to an elevator scene, and then literally a minute later, it then transforms into um, this big roast, which is just phenomenal to think about how quickly that happens. It happens all within five minutes, um, which I think you'll really enjoy when you come to see the show. Um, so the last thing before we open up for questions, uh, is just to talk about how we, anything more to talk about for the transfer to Dartmouth or, or the next steps as? <laughs> I think I may leave that to questions if people have, have specific questions about that. But um, uh, it, in some ways, almost the transfer to Dartmouth for us was a tiny bit easier because we do work in repertory at the Stratford Festival. So we do Coriolanus in the afternoon and then we did Rocky Horror Show in the, in the evening. And then the next afternoon we did Ideal Husband and the evening after that we did Napoli Millionaria. And then the next afternoon we did Coriolanus and that's, we just go from one to another to another. And so we change from one show to the next in, uh, in about an hour and a half. The difficulty with Coriolanus is it's actually set three feet high, higher. So because it's all framed in by a three foot frame, the deck is three feet higher than the normal um, stage. Because of the number of things that you've seen in these images that come onto the stage from backstage, it also means, so it, what you see on stage, the depth is about, it's about from the very front to the furthest back that you'll see is 13 and a half feet. So it's a very actually tiny shallow stage that all of this takes place in. And then backstage, there is about 10 times that all again raised to a three foot level that takes uh, that that takes and deals with the coordination of of moving scenery constantly scenery props um, uh, dollies that bring things in and out um, so as we changed uh, over from one show to another not only were we changing over our set we were also changing over the entire backstage as well so not me I was just in charge. <laughs> Questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm interested to know how your the, the stage and the backstage of the war uh, compares to your space. Was it, I mean, it had to be somewhat similar. That's a perfect question. That's a great question. It's exactly the opposite. <laughs> Uh, literally, it, it's uh, take our backstage, we have this tiny stage left, and we have a larger stage right, flip the whole thing and you're in the Moore Theater. Um, now, and so one of the challenges we had was how do you then take uh, a show where you have the actors for an afternoon and you have the entire crew for the day before, how do you manage to get uh, to unlearn, relearn, rejig six months of running a show into something completely different. Um, and so uh, we knew early on that this is what we were dealing with. Um, and, so, and so I largely left the rejigging of how that would work to our assistant stage manager, Melissa Rood, and our, our head carpenter, Sean Poole, who's in the back there. Um, and, uh, and they sat down and what they, the aim was not if the aim could not be to flip the entire show because we would have lost actors by the third scene. Um, as, so the aim was actually to keep the changes as minimal as possible um, but deal with the fact that we had this vastly different space. So one of the interesting things is um, this piece of scenery that we call the camp ramp is basically this large three foot high ramp that comes across the entire stage. We always set it from stage right and it came on, the screens revealed, the video moved with it and all came from stage right. All of a sudden we don't have the room to do it here. So we're like, okay, we'll do it from stage left. Um, but what that means is we have to reverse all the audio 
automation, so the screens come from the different, uh, different position, but we also have to reverse the video. So the video, which was, a, which was a media graphic built to travel in this way, all of a sudden had to be reversed to travel in this way. We got here and we put uh, the camp ramp on stage and I'm not sure what happened, but one iteration of it all, it worked. And then sometime towards the end of last week, the head of, of automation for the show came to me and said, Alyssa, we got a problem. We don't have room for the camp ramp. Because the other thing we had to deal with was uh, accommodating a fire door break um, going from the backstage to the scene shop. And so, so there's an area where there's a fire door comes down. We, of course, were putting... Um, three foot high ramps under. So we had built in advance uh, a fire break there. It was part of the new stuff that we brought in with us. But I, I, I for some reason, at some point went, we don't need a riser here. And then all of a sudden I went, oh gosh, we need a riser here. And so I called home and I said, can you build me a riser that goes into this area? It has to go over the firewall, so it's sort of tricky, different design. They're like, yeah, 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 we know exactly what you're talking about. I said, it has to have the tracks and the knife will work like this. And they're like, yeah, 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 we know exactly what you're talking about. I said, it needs to uh, be picked up um, in a day and a half and be delivered to Dartmouth um, after Thanksgiving weekend. And went, yeah, 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 we'll figure it out. And that's the glory of working at the Stratford Festival is that that actually happened. <laughs> we had to do reblocking for that one scene, um, so entrances come from, from a different place, but it's very, I don't think we had to do any other reblocking. Sean? No, no other reblocking. So, yes. Go. Cool. So, you're doing a lot backstage while action's going on on stage. How do you keep it all quiet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sean? <laughs> it is it, one of the huge challenges is trying to keep it quiet because these are big, often noisy pieces. Uh, one of the things I did uh, this afternoon after watching the matinee is I went to our sound, I went to our sound operator and I said, and I said, uh, your underscoring is too quiet. And he's like, well, I was wondering about that, if maybe, the and I said, no, your underscoring is too quiet, and the impact out of that is I'm hearing a lot more stuff that I wouldn't hear from backstage. He's like, right, so the importance of that underscoring isn't just that it helps to set a scene, it also hides all the stuff that's going on behind it. So, yeah, it's a huge challenge, um, and, the, and, and it's one of the things that when we did that, that hiatus sit around a table is one of the things we had to talk about. How do we keep it quiet? So, uh, hi. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> yes. the, it, the first question that you answered made me wonder if the venue you have picked for next month's production in Montreal was chosen to facilitate all of these changes you had to make from Stratford to Dartmouth. So the question was whether that we're going to Montreal with Coriolanus next month, and the question was whether the venue was chosen, um, uh, uh, I, I guess, to uh, as a reflection of some of the changes we made here, and the answer is no. Um, <laughs> uh, no, we're going to, um, uh, the show is going to Teatro Nouveau Monde uh, uh, because they are a partner with us in, uh, in, in the producing of this show. And they will actually be producing a, a, an entirely French production with a new cast, um, but using the same design team, using the same scenery, using um, some of uh, our, our crew and people to, to get them there. But um, no, Teatro Nouveau du Monde is a, uh, they're a partner in, pre in, in presenting this. Yes, hi, at the back. Um, ha, ha, this is so complicated. Um, has anything gone wrong? Have there been like, <laughs> bad <laughs> screw-ups? If, if so, what happens? What do you do? How do you handle that? It's been perfect. Uh, the question was, has anything gone wrong and how do you go out of it, get out of it? So um, I've been up since 7.30 this morning and I have not had more than about eight minutes uh, stopping break. Um, I came directly into this room from being in the theater because one of the things that happened in 
uh, in transferring a show, we're not, using, we're not using the same projectors here that we use at home. And we're not doing that because our projectors are being used on another show at home. So we couldn't just take them out of the system and bring them because Rocky Horror Show would have been a bit upset at us. Um, so, we, so we rented what was exactly the same projector, except it wasn't exactly the same projector. It had a different input card. Well, last week they decided that was going to be fine. We were working at 60 frames, 60 uh, hertz of frames per second. That was going to be f originally. Now we're down to 30 hertz. That's going to be fine. It won't be noticeable to the eye. And yesterday when we did a, uh, a run through and I watched our live camera scene, I went, I went, oh, oh, that's visible to the eye. Um, and, and for me, as the person who's technically in charge of this piece, it was embarrassing. Um, it was, it, 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 and, and also with the knowledge of where Robert wants to be with this show, it was embarrassing and it wasn't acceptable. Um, and yet, we were all, there was a point where, where I, I turned to our producer on this show and I said, I said, it's horrible, I'm embarrassed by this, and there's nothing we can do. Like, this is it. Like, we've talked through it, there is no answer, we've been told it's a hardware problem, I can't switch out the hardware, that's it. And so, and so then he actually, he kind of said to me, hmm, Alyssa, I've, I've never really heard you say that. And, and, I, and I disappointedly was like, yeah, I know. Um, but actually him saying that sort of motivated me to go, yeah, you know what, he's right. I'm, uh, I'm gonna take the next step, I'm gonna push, I'm gonna, what are the questions I have to ask? And so I started to go through those questions. I started to do a little bit more research than I'd done initially. And then I took that bit of research and I went to my video people and I went, I don't understand what you're telling me. You're telling me that this is true, and yet here's what I see to be true. And they're like, you know, yeah, that's confusing. Uh, let's, make, let's make another call. Let's do a series. Anyway, so we, we began down a path. And we began down a path that involved um, dealing with the company that makes our projectors. We walked down a path that um, uh, followed with the people who rented us the projectors. We walked down a path with the people who make the uh, media servers and the system um, uh, that, that controls all the video. We went down a path with them. Um, between those three paths, we got to a solution at uh, about 5.30 this evening. And so the show that people will see tomorrow at 10 a.m. is not the show that embarrasses me. <laughs> now, you may not have even noticed what it is, but I did, and it, and it was important, and tomorrow will be a better show. So what do you do when stuff happens? <sighs> you keep asking questions. You just keep asking questions. Last question. Speaking of keeping <laughs> asking questions. <laughs> That was the best part. So all this video projection, I always think the video coming from the back. Is your video coming from the back or up in between these sets? How does it play your So we have a video that comes from the back because we have a curved psych at, at the rear. So there's three projectors at the back and they're, um, they're projecting, I mean basically they project a single image, but they're all communicating with each other going, I'm projecting here, well, I'm projecting here, but I'm also projecting there, so we're gonna cross over a little, and, and so let's be a bit lighter in this area because there's two of us, and so they're all communicating and blending, and that's our rear projection. From the front, we have uh, three projectors that sit on the balcony rail as well. So all together, we have six projectors for this show. So front and back but not all amidst and amongst. The car, the car comes from the balcony, yeah. The balcony being slightly higher, we're able to do the top as well, so. Thank you well, so thank much you very time. much, everyone. <laughs>